Horn Church Control, put up 222 two, two, and 603 squadrons to intercept hostile 26. Two, 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 In 1940, German forces invaded France and conquered it in six weeks. Only a month before, Denmark and Norway had been conquered, and soon Belgium, Luxembourg and the Netherlands would fall to the Blitzkrieg. In that hot summer of 1940, Britain and her allies stood alone against the might of the Nazi war machine. In this video, I'm going to be looking at how Yorkshire contributed to Britain's finest hour. During the fall of France, there was a crisis in the British government. Should the British, having been forced out of France, lost a staggering amount of equipment at Dunkirk and now facing the full might of the Nazi war machine across the English Channel, pursue diplomatic peace negotiations with Hitler? Many certainly thought so, and Hitler himself proposed some form of negotiations. But this was probably a superficial and shallow attempt to buy more time. He had made it explicitly clear, even before the war, his plans for attacking Britain. Even before the invasion of Poland, in Directive No. 1, in August 1939, he said, attacks on the English homeland are to be prepared. And in Directive No. 9, in November 1939, he said, the defeat of England is essential to final victory. Not that you needed reminding, but Hitler was a man who had broken almost every treaty and agreement he had signed, who was secretly planning on betraying his ally, the Soviet Union, by invading them the next year, who had no guarantee of actually upholding his end of the bargain and leaving Britain alone, who had taken advantage of every single concession given to him by Chamberlain, and who had entered the war under the rather childish delusion that he could go conquer anyone he wanted and there'd been nobody there to stop him. Hitler wanted peace, there was peace on his terms. He wanted to be able to do whatever he wanted in Europe without any interference on Britain. And he believed that Britain would be forced to accept this because it would be so weakened from the defeat in France that it would be in no position to refuse. And to that, there was only one thing to say. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We will never surrender. The Battle of France was over. The Battle of Britain had begun. The aim of the Battle of Britain was to force Britain to come to these negotiations. This would be achieved by defeating the Royal Air Force and gaining total air superiority. Then, with Britain suitably weakened and defeat inevitable, she would come to the table for negotiations and, if not, invasion would be the final push. On the 16th of July 1940, Hitler ordered Directive No. 16, which outlined the invasion, named Operation Sea Lion. It began... As England, in spite of her hopeless military situation, still shows no signs of willingness to come to terms, I have decided to prepare, and if necessary to carry out, a landing operation against her. The aim of this operation is to eliminate the English motherland as a base from which the war against Germany can be continued, and if necessary, to occupy the country completely. The Luftwaffe firmly believed that the RAF was sufficiently weakened for this. During the fall of France, the RAF had lost 936 aircraft, most of them fighters, and over 1,500 men. Britain had in total 1,963 fighters and bombers for the Battle of Britain. Germany had over 2,500. Whilst a rapid production of new planes was underway, preparations for the defence of the country went ahead. Sir Hugh Dowding, commander of the RAF, masterminded this aerial defence system. A series of early warning coastal radar systems, called Chain Home, were installed along the east coast with two in Yorkshire. One at Staxton Wold in Scarborough, which was also the site of a Roman coastal signal station which served a similar purpose, and the other at Danby Beacon at Whitby. On the 3rd of February 1940, the site at Danby Beacon detected a Heinkel bomber approaching. It was soon shot down over Whitby, thus becoming the first enemy aircraft to be shot down over England in the war. 
These radar stations could detect aircraft to a range of 120 miles, but a severe flaw was that they struggled to detect low-flying aircraft. As such, a chain home low system was installed with a range of 50 miles, which could detect these low-flying aircraft. These were at Bempton, Easington, Ravenscar and Goldsboro. Similarly, Goldsboro was also used as an early warning station by the Romans. Together with the Observer Corps, these early detection systems were vital to the outcome of the Battle of Britain by detecting enemy aircraft and allowing pilots to scramble in time. While these preparations were underway, Yorkshire was at the vanguard of the industrial war effort. For example, for the first 18 months of the war, the only factory where crankshafts for the Supermarine Spitfire could be made was at Vickers in Sheffield. There are far too many factories to list, but the industrial centres in cities all over Yorkshire and the ordinary men and women who operated them are essential for the war effort. I'll go into more detail about this in my video about the Blitz in Yorkshire. Meanwhile, let's look at some of the units which fought in the Battle of Britain and were from Yorkshire. Britain was divided into four RAF groups. Most of Yorkshire in the north of Britain were in Group 13, with some of Yorkshire in Group 12. The southeast, the most crucial area, was in Group 11, and they bore the brunt of the fighting. A large number of airfields in Yorkshire were dedicated to Bomber Command, and so did not take part directly in the Battle of Britain. But this meant that these airfields became a serious target. One such example is RAF Driffield, which, on the 15th of August, right in the middle of the most intense period of the Battle of Britain, was targeted by over 50 Junker 88 bombers. Fighters from the nearby RAF Leckenfield near Beverley intercepted them, though unfortunately the bombers reached their target. With over 150 bomb hits, 14 people died and 10 bombers on the airfield were destroyed. Despite Yorkshire's seemingly limited involvement in the Battle of Britain, they would have crucial other roles. Airfields would often be used as a place where battle-scarred squadrons could rest and recover back to fighting status in more safety than down south. Around 20% of the pilots who flew in the Battle of Britain were from either the Empire, exiles of the occupied countries, or volunteers from America. Yorkshire airfields were the creation spot for many of these units. RAF Church Fenton, near Tadcaster, saw the creation of three famous foreign units. One was Number 71 Squadron, one of the three RAF Eagle Squadrons. Before America officially joined the war, there was a large number of American volunteer pilots. These came to England, and a squadron of them was formed at Church Fenton. Another unit formed was Number 306 Polish Fighter Squadron, formed entirely out of exiled Polish pilots. Finally, Number 242 Squadron, known unofficially as a Canadian squadron due to the high number of Canadian personnel, was formed. In all of these cases, the squadrons were formed at Church Fenton in either 1939 or 1940 before being moved elsewhere for active duty. Number 303 Squadron, another Polish squadron, was the highest scoring hurricane squadron in the RAF during the Battle of Britain and created at Blackpool in July 1940 before being stationed near London. Three out of the four Polish fighter squadrons were all formed in Yorkshire and they were renowned for their brave, if at times reckless, approach to combat. Now, if the pilots were the few, then the people who worked in the background were the many, and just one example is the Air Transport Auxiliary. The ATA was a civilian organisation who transported planes and supplies around the country for the RAF. One famous member is Amy Johnson, a woman from Hull who had already achieved worldwide fame for being the first woman to fly solo from Britain to Australia, but now flew planes from the factories to RAF airfields. There was a unit of the ATA in Leeds, and many people who could not join the RAF were able to join the ATA and do their bit. The ATA was crucial to the outcome of the battle, as without them pilots who would otherwise have been available would have had to perform their jobs themselves, and as such, the ATA allowed for more pilots to be available to fight. The Women's Auxiliary Air Force, known as the WAFs, were trained at RAF Harrogate. They helped with all manner of things, from radar, to transport, intelligence, to map plotting. Now, I could literally spend all day telling the amazing stories of individuals who did their bit in the Battle of Britain, but for the sake of brevity, I'm going to leave that out. I have already made one video telling just one story of someone who became not just one of Britain's top fighting aces in the Battle of Britain, but in the entire war. It's a really astonishing story, and I'd really recommend checking that one out. 
Now, although we tend to think of the Battle of Britain as being exclusively a fighter plane, dogfight type thing, in reality, the Bomber Command actually had a really important role as well. In fact, in Winston Churchill's famous The Few speech, he gives them huge credit for their role in the conflict. By bombing strategic targets like roads, railways and airfields, the bomber units of Yorkshire were able to help cripple the Luftwaffe. These constant bombing runs had the effect of disturbing the sleep of German pilots, which reportedly had serious consequences for the German airmen, meaning they could not fight at their best. By the end of August and beginning of September, the Nazis realised their strategy wasn't working. They couldn't destroy the RAF, so they started to bomb towns and cities instead. This was the start of the Blitz. In the course of the Battle of Britain, over 1,700 British aircraft had been destroyed, and over 1,500 aircrew had lost their lives. But nearly 2,000 German planes had been shot down, and over 2,500 German aircrew had died. Though the Battle of Britain was over, there was still the Blitz to endure. That's all I've got time for today. Now, I know I've covered a lot in this video, it's a bit of a mammoth, but that's because I wanted to cover all bases and really show the wide and deep history of the involvement of Yorkshire in the Battle of Britain. I really hope you've enjoyed it because I put a lot of time and effort into this and I hope to see you again soon. <laughs> Our hearts will still live on